Good morning. Okay, so uh, we'll continue today with our uh, lectures. Today we're starting a new topic. In today's lecture, we will be covering uh, the first and the second laws of a Newton. And we will be solving also problems. The textbook sections we're covering is from 5.3 to 5.5. And more problem solving with the Newton's laws in the next lecture. So let me start with this uh, example that will demonstrate uh, the first law of a Newton. If we have Spider-Man that who has zero resultant force acting on him, what is the magnitude of the tension? and his webbing. So we have Spider-Man being stationary, which means he has zero resultant force. We need to calculate the tension of the rope of this webbing. So the first thing we need to do is to draw the free body diagram for Spider-Man. So a dot for Spider-Man. And then let me first put the coordinates right at Spider-Man's Spider -Man position. So this is X. And this is why. Then based on the forces that are applied on Spider-Man, we have the gravitational force pointing downward, and we have the tension force due to those two webbings. One of them is here, and the second one is here, with the same angle, which is 15 degrees. Since the angle is the same, so we have a symmetry, we have a symmetry here, right? So those two tension forces are the same, and we need to calculate this tension force. So what do we know? We know the magnitude of the gravitational force to be 735 in Newton. So Fg is 735 Newtons. So dealing with vectors, again, we need to get their components. And then since the object, since Spider-Man is stationary, those forces are going to cancel each other or balance out. So in this case, if I project them on the X and on the Y, then I can say that Sigma of the forces on the X should equal to zero. And in this case, what are the forces that I have on the X? I have T cosine 15 degrees positive. So this is T cosine 15. Let me call this one Tx. And I have here minus Tx. 
which is minus C cosine 15 degrees equals to zero. And that was expected. So the projection or the component of the tension of the webbing on the right is canceling the force due to the webbing tension force on the left side. What about the forces along the y-axis? If I am to project this one here, I get, this is Ty, and this one is also Ty. So I have T sine 15, which is, this is Ty, plus T sine 15 degrees minus Fg. Fg has only one component on the Y. Fg has only one component on the y axis and it's negative because it's pointing in the opposite direction to my positive. So I will write it as minus Fg and this equals to zero. So I have here two T sine 15 Point two six minus seven thirty five equals to zero, and in this case, the tension force is seven thirty five divided by two times point two six, and the tension force is seven is 1,413 newtons. So this is basically what new first law of a Newton, Newton's first law states. If you have an object that is stationary, then the net forces applied on that object should be zero. Now this applies on objects who are, who are stationary. And why? Because if I have a net force of zero, this means I have zero acceleration. Now, if I have zero acceleration, then I have two cases where Newton's first law applies. When the object is stationary, the net forces on that object is zero, or when the object is moving in a constant velocity. Why? Because if the object is moving in a constant velocity, the acceleration would be zero. In other words, Newton's first law applies whenever you have zero acceleration on that object, which means zero net forces. In other words, this object is either stationary or if he has an initial velocity, he's going to continue with that velocity with no change. And this is what we have seen in the, in the X, in the horizontal motion for the projector motion. If you recall, the velocity was constant. Why? Because there was no acceleration along the X axis. So Newton's first law is applied when I have zero acceleration. In this case, the object would be either stationary or moving in a constant velocity. This is extremely important to know. We will be looking at this example as well. So here in this example, we have a dragging, we, we have you are dragging a crate with mass 2.17 kilograms. 
across the floor at a constant velocity of 0 0.2 meter per second to the right. With the horizontal rope, the floor exerts a frictional force of 6.05 Newton on the crate. What is the magnitude of the tension in the rope? This is A. B, what is the magnitude of the normal force exerted on the crate? So in order to solve this problem, we need to draw the, the free body diagram where we have here the floor, and this is the crate moving into the moving to the right. So I'll put my coordinates here. X, Y. So if it's moving to the right, then I have the force here. Tension. What else do I have? I have the, the friction force, which is in the opposite direction of the motion. 6.05. Six point zero five. Let me say west. So I have it going this way. What else do I have? I have the gravitational force, which is perpendicular here on the floor. And I also have the normal force. The mass is 2.17. I have a constant velocity, 0 0.2 meter per second. So it is important to notice that since I have a constant velocity, in this case, the acceleration will be zero. If you recall, Vx equals to V naught, Vx naught, plus Ax t. If the velocities are equal, this means the acceleration would be zero. Okay, so we have a constant velocity. This means the acceleration is zero. I can apply Newton's first law. I need to calculate for the tension. So I have sigma f x equals to zero, and I also have sigma f y equals to zero. We need the tension. So for the sigma f x, what do I have based on the coordinates, the reference that I put in my problem, I have the tension being substituted here in this as positive. I have the friction, this is F friction, as minus 6.05, and this equals to zero. This means the tension force is 6.05 Newton. I have nothing else except for this tension force that equals to the friction because it's going in a constant velocity. Now, what is the magnitude of the normal force in this case exerted on the crate? 
sigma fy equals to zero. Sigma fy equals to zero, which means based on the positive direction that I have, fn is positive and fg is minus m mg equals to zero. So I substituted the acceleration with minus 9.8. So the cause for this minus is because the acceleration is pointing downward, right? So I have here minus mg, which means that fn is m g f n as 2.17 times 9.8 and f n equals to twenty one point two seven newton. Any question about this problem? So in summary, Newton's first law, the sigma of the forces along the x-axis equals to the sigma of the forces along the y-axis, both equals to zero. Why? Because the acceleration is zero. And the acceleration is zero happens in two cases. Either the object is a stationary, or the object is moving with a constant velocity. Questions? Okay. Now let's move on to Newton's second law. In case I have a net force now applied on my object, then I cannot use Newton's first law anymore. Why? because there is a net force and I have to consider that resultant force with the acceleration that it's going to cause for that object that has a mass. So in this case, this acceleration that is a vector equals to what? Equals to the, that resultant force, which is a vector divided by the mass of this object which means based on the understanding of the mass being a positive scalar, this acceleration will always be in the same direction of the resultant force. Keep this in mind. This is extremely important point that will make things for you way easier to deal with. Having said that, acceleration is a vector. Well, we've seen how we can treat vectors we will be treating their components, their projections on the coordinates. In this case, I will be dealing with the X component of the acceleration and the Y component of the acceleration that are coming from the X component of the resultant force and the Y component of the resultant force. So we've seen how to deal with those motions that the one of them along the x and the second one along the y axis. Here, we have acceleration along the x axis. It's different than the projector motion that we, we've dealt with in previous lectures. So, what is the x component of the acceleration? Sigma fx divided by m. What is the y component of the acceleration? Sigma f r y, which is the resultant, the y component of the resultant force divided by, by m. Or I can say here, sigma f x equals to m a x sigma fy equals to m times a y.
Again, one in Newton equals to one kilogram meter per second squared. We've seen how we calculated the gravitational force, but the gravitational force is only related to the gravitational acceleration. Keep this in mind. We're gonna to come to an example where we see how we treat the gravitational force with the existence of other forces on an object to calculate the resultant force or the net force. So let's look at this example here. In this example, we have, soon after jumping out of an airplane, we have a skydiver of a mass 67 kilograms, experiences an upward air resistance force. So a force due to the air resistance that is 567 Newton pointing up. What is the acceleration, magnitude and direction of the skydiver? So the first thing we need to do, as usual, draw the free body diagram for the skydiver. So what do we have? What are the forces applied on the skydiver? We have the gravitational force. And we also have the air resistance force. Again, I will put my coordinates right on the skydiver. So the skydiver is experiencing an acceleration, is experiencing a net force. So for me, sigma f y equals to m a y. The sigma f x along the x axis for that skydiver for this problem is zero, right? Assuming the skydiver is descending vertically here. So in this case, what are the forces that I do have? I have, if I am to substitute the forces with the directions based on my coordinates here again, I have F air pointing upward. And I also have due to the gravitational force pointing downward, this FG is substituted as minus m, or let me say, minus g, and this equals to m a y. So I have the g pointing downward, right? So what is the f air? 567 in Newton plus 67 kilograms times minus 9.8 equals 67 times AY. Rearranging, I have here 567 minus 67 times 9.8 is minus 89.667 AY. In this case, AY is 
minus 89.6 divided by 67. AY is minus. One point three four meter per second square. So this is the total acceleration applied on the skydiver due to the net force between the gravitational force and the air resistance force. Any questions so far about how did we calculate this acceleration? We looked at the net force. The net force was pointing downward, which means the acceleration is related to that net force divided by the mass of this object, then you get the acceleration. And it was expected that the acceleration due to the net force to be pointing downward. So let me ask you this question. This question from the centripetal acceleration section. If I have a car rounds a curve while maintaining a constant speed, is there an is there a non-zero net force on the car as it rounds on the curve? Do you think there will be a net force? Remember, this car is taking a curvature with a constant speed, which means it is experiencing a centripetal acceleration, right? So if it's experiencing a centripetal acceleration, then there should be a net force applied in the same direction of the centripetal acceleration. And the answer is yes. So always keep in mind, if you have a centripetal acceleration, you have a force, net force also pointing in the same direction of the centripetal acceleration. Now let's go back to the elevator pro problem again. Consider an elevator that is accelerating downward. The upward tension force exerted on the elevator is, what do you think? We have an elevator that is accelerating downward. Do you think the tension force would be larger than identical or smaller than the downward force of the gravity acting on the elevator. You have two forces, right? You have the tension force and you have the gravitational force. However, you do have an acceleration going downward, which means there is a net force, right? So if there is a net force, so let me draw my elevator here, and this is the tension, and this is the gravitational force. If there is an acceleration pointing downward, what does this mean? This means that there is a net force pointing downward, right? So if there's a net force pointing downward, then this net force is FR. Now again, let me take my coordinates, X and Y. This FR is the net force of those two forces. What does this tell you? In order to have a net force pointing in one direction, what does this mean? One of them has to be greater than the other one, right? 
if you're subtracting two vectors, then the resulting vector will be pointing toward the, the larger one, right? The greater one. Is that right? So in this case, if your net force is pointing downward, what does this tell you? This tells you that the tension is less than the gravitational force. So if I am to translate this into an equation, knowing that the positive direction is up, I can say T is up minus FR minus Fg equals to zero. No, hold on a second. It's in the same direction of the... It is Fr, the net is Fg minus T, because this is the net. And it's in the same direction as the, the FG. So in this case, T is FG minus FR, which means T is smaller than FG, right? Because the net here is the one that the net force is going in the same direction. This means that force is greater than the, larger than the first one. Is that right? You talk, you're looking at the difference, and this difference is going in the direction of one of, e, one of those vectors, which means the one that the net is going in its direction is greater than the, the other one. So you write it as Fg minus, minus T. And in this case, the tension force would be smaller than the gravitational force. So let's look at this one. Consider an elevator that is accelerating downward the upward normal force exerted on the person is larger, identical, smaller than the gravitational force. Same concept. The same concept. You look at the direction of the acceleration and then the net force, the resultant force is in that direction, is in the direction of the acceleration. So if you were to, again, to draw the free body diagram, you have here T, and you have Fg, or normal. The acceleration is pointing downward. Right? Which means the resultant force would be pointing also downward. This is the net force, which basically means this FR is FG minus FN. And in this case, I have FN equals to FG minus FR, which means Fn is smaller than, than Fg. So the answer is C. Is this clear? Now, let me ask you this question. If 
if the elevator is going up, Which force is, is a greater? Is Fn greater than Fg? Acceleration is pointing up. What does this mean? If you have a scale that you're putting under, under your feet, would you be reading this, the scale increasing than your normal weight or decreasing? Would it be reading higher or lower? Who has an answer to this? If you're going up, accelerating up. Lower? Why? So are you expecting the normal force to be smaller than the gravitational force or greater? Greater, which means the reading would be re the, would you'll be seeing on the scale would be would be higher, right? Would be would be larger. Why? Because if you have an acceleration pointing upward, this means you have a net force pointing up. So let me call this one F R. Then in this case, I have F R equals to Fn minus Fg because the net force is pointing in the direction of the Fn, which means Fn equals to Fg plus Fr. So Fn is a greater than Fg. So you'll be reading on the scale a number that is higher than your regular weight. Any question about the uh, elevator problem? Yes, go ahead. The net force is always in the direction of the acceleration. So let's look at this problem here. In this problem, we have a boy's car being pushed with a broom handle. The total mass of the car and the boy is 36.7 kilogram. So let me start with the drawing the, the free body diagram here. So this is the, the car with the boy. I would like to put my coordinates right here at the location of the... The mass is 36.7. So I have here mass. 36.7 kilograms. The, the force 
of the broom, making an angle of 69.3 with the vertical. 69.3 with the vertical. So if I put this force here, this is the same 69.3 degrees. Seventy two point seven seven the Newtons and there is a friction force of the magnitude twelve point seven, which is in this direction. So we have Twelve point seven newtons. If the boy starts from rest, how far will the car travel in one point five seconds? So we have time one point five seconds, and we have v x not being zero. What else? So this is what we have. We have this car moving due to a force that is applied on it. There is a friction. We also have normal force and we have gravitational force. So if I am to put the, the normal force and the gravitational force, then I need to apply Newton's second law, right? So let's apply Newton's second law along the x-axis. So we have Fx, sigma Fx equals to M Ax. So what do we have here? Again, based on the positive direction, you can see that the motion is happening in this direction, but my positive reference is in the opposite direction, right? So not, ne not always, not necessarily that you have to take the positive reference always in the same direction. You could have taken it in the other way around. So for me, sigma fx is, will be, we'll start with the, with the f push, I will project it right on the X. It will be a negative. And I also have the friction in the opposite direction, but will be positive. So Sigma FX, I have minus if push sine 69.3 degrees, right? I have plus F, F. So those are all the component of the X on the X from the forces that I have. The projection of the push force on the negative X direction and the friction in the positive X direction. So in this case, it was to M times AX. I need to find the acceleration. So in this case, let me substitute here, minus 72.7 times sine 69.3. Which is point nine three plus twelve point seven equals to sixty seven thirty six point seven times AX.
So minus 60, 68 plus 12.7 equals to 36.7 AX. What are you expecting AX to be, negative or positive? Negative or positive? Can somebody tell me why did we get an acceleration to be negative? And what does that mean? What does a negative acceleration here mean? Yes. They're going backward. They're accelerating backward. Exactly like you're, you're driving your car, accelerating but going backward. But you're accelerating but backward. So we found the acceleration on the x-direction based on our positive uh, coordinates. It is accelerating backward. Now we need to calculate the, the distance this car traveled at 1.5 seconds, starting from rest. So which equation do you think is the best equation to to use to calculate for the final displacement. X equals two, X naught plus VX naught T plus half AX T squared. So we need to calculate the displacement after 1.5 seconds, starting from, from rest, which means starting from rest means that the initial velocity is zero, right? And we're starting from the point that we assume to be zero, my X naught right there when I started. This is my reference for the position. It is zero. So if this one is zero, then the whole thing is zero here. So what do I have here? I have x equals to zero plus zero plus half. Ax is minus 1.51. T squared is 1.5 squared. And in this case, x is, are you expecting X to be negative or positive? Minus 1.7 meter. So we went backward. 1.7 meter in displacement, okay? So let me stop here. We'll stop here and we'll continue on Monday.